Welcome to the A16Z podcast. I'm Michael Copeland. Costello and Ben Horowitz talk about leadership in front of an audience of military veterans and active duty soldiers on this segment of the A16Z podcast. What Silicon Valley can learn from the military's approach to leadership and how that applies and doesn't to building today's technology companies. Does leadership, does it transfer from one venue to another? So in this case, from the military to Silicon Valley. Well, I hope so, because like all my favorite management books are military books. So there's like The Art of War. There's the Colin Powell book, My American Journey. There's um, the Black Jacobin, so the uh, Toussaint Louverture book. The problem with leadership in general is uh, the easy thing to do is generally the wrong thing to do. So you sort of slide into that. Um, And the great thing about uh, the military leadership books is like everybody's going to die if you do that. Uh, whereas in like companies, it's not actually life and death. One of my uh, favorite Sun Tzu stories, which is I shouldn't even tell this story because it's it's uh, so violent. But um, there is a you know they're doing calisthenics and uh, during the calisthenics, two of the guys are talking and you're not allowed to talk in calisthenics. So he just walks over to the guys talking, tells them to stand up, takes out a sword and cuts off his head. No more talking in calisthenics <laughs> after that, like that work. Not that you should do that in a company. Speeches don't do anything, but like an object lesson like that, cut his head off. They're like, okay, like everybody learned that and nobody's ever going to forget it. You give an all-hand speech, nobody's going to remember it tomorrow. And so, you know, these kinds of things are super powerful. And it is like, it's a pretty straight translation in that way. For me, I had several folks in my company who were leaders in the military and they were the most mentally tough people in the company. I remember... Um, The night of the IPO, you know, the stock was at like 47 and we had priced it at 16 on the S1 like two weeks earlier. And I got up in front of everybody and said, listen, it took us seven years to get from zero to 16. And now here we are two weeks later and it's 47. It's not 47 because the company got three times more awesome in the last two weeks. Right. (laughs) So just remember, it's going to go down. Right. But that's okay because we priced it at 16 two weeks ago. So we're it's great. It's at 47. It's at 47 now, but it might be 16 again. Just remember, that's not mean. It's that's not bad. Just as the fact that it's 47 today is not based on we got that much more awesome in two weeks. So I thought, well, great. Like I've prepared them. You know, I've I've inoculated them to in the inevitable stock going down. And of course, he's shaking his head because he knows exactly how this goes. (laughs) The moment the stock goes down, everyone's like, "Oh my God, what's wrong? You know, what did we do wrong?" And you know, Dave Lagaki, who is a, a, a CEO, and Anthony Noto, my CFO, and Russ Laraway um, on my sales team, who was in the Marines, were three of the three of the people who are like, you know, I, yep, we get it. We're we're staying focused. We know exactly what we have to do. They were great with their team. They didn't they didn't lose people on their teams. Um, they didn't have any churn. Um, so I always looked for people like that who I knew were going to be mentally tough and be able to deal with, you know the ups and downs of the company. And that goes for private companies as well, as Ben knows. I mean, half the time you're like, oh my God, this is the best day of, you know, this is the company's going amazingly well. And two days later, like everything's ruined. We're going to be out of business in a week. (laughs) And you just need people who are mentally tough. You know, I I got up one day at an all hands and showed just a picture of Michelangelo's David. And I said, all during the Renaissance, these Renaissance artists portrayed David and Goliath as the moment after David chopped off Goliath's head, you know, the uh, Verrocchio and Donatello bronze statues are. He's standing on top of his head with the sword, and, and um, Caravaggio's got this bloody, you know, painting where he's chopping off his head. And Michelangelo chose to portray him just before he's about to throw the rock at him. And uh, he's got the sling over his shoulder and the rock in his hands, and he's focused, you know, and his muscles are sort of tense. And I said, you know, Michelangelo chose to portray him in the moment between conscious choice and decisive action. He knows what he's got to do, and now he's got to go do it irrespective of all the other noise. Right. I said, just keep that in mind when the media comes in and says, this is you know, what you're doing wrong and you should be doing this. <clears throat> and the people who had been in the military and military leaders were the best at helping relate that story to their teams. Right. People talk about wartime CEOs and peacetime CEOs. Is that a real thing or is it just gradations of war? Well, I started that you know, with the... Uh peacetime CEO, wartime CEO blog post, I think. Yeah. And and I actually got it from my friend Bill Campbell, who used to kind of talk about it to me a bit. I think that the thing is management books are written 
almost entirely from the perspective of peacetime. And so that, that, that was the thing that I was trying to get out. They're designed to make it look simple. And so then a lot of the things stylistically that come out of it, like one of the things that you always get in management books, um, is never, ever berate anybody in public. But then you read about guys like Steve Jobs and Andy Grove all day long. They're berating people in public. <laughs> and like they were the most successful. So like what's going on here? It does get down to, look, there are times when you need so much precision that like if you're going to lose somebody in the whatever war for talent because they got their feelings hurt, well, that's just going to be how it's got to be because you need to teach that Sun Tzu object lesson like somebody's getting their head chopped off for the good of the whole because like the army's got to stay disciplined. You know, that is kind of the wartime mentality. Now, like if you do that all the time and you're doing it in peacetime, then like nobody's going to want to work for you. And and like, so that that is a real thing. And you do want to, like you want to develop people and um, give them a chance to make mistakes and not like create an environment of so much fear that people are afraid to talk. And, and all these things are important, but at the same time, there are situations where you're really going to lose a company if people don't do what they're supposed to do, and so you've got to treat those that way. Um, so, yeah, I do think there are both. Yeah, sometimes you're both yeah. at the same time inside the company, right? With Remember there are times at Twitter where with the sales team, I could focus on, all right, this is really good. This engine's really working. It's going well. Let's focus on, you know, building better leaders, and let's focus on how can we improve the way we're working with resellers, you know, and meanwhile over in product, you know, I'm like, what's the matter with the, mm-hmm. this thing taking like four weeks instead of, you know, that was yeah. supposed to be out yesterday, et cetera. Right. Dick, the, the team that you described at Twitter were like, they stayed focused. They didn't lose anyone when the, when the stock was falling. What engenders loyalty and commitment in Silicon Valley? How can you build teams that have your back yeah. and, yeah. and will stick together? This is going to sound probably trite, but I'll explain it. Um, trust. You know, the best leaders tell everyone on their team the same thing, and they don't manage by trying to be liked. They manage by, you know, telling everyone the truth and being honest and direct with them. Um, and the reason that those several teams didn't lose people is because those leaders at that point told them, hey, you remember the night of the IPO when Dick gave us this talk? It's We're going to go through this rough patch. All companies do. The media is going to beat the shit out of us for the next two months. Come and ask me if you have any questions. It's going to get really tough. The stock might even go, might go down a lot further. And so people are like, okay. And then when that happens, they're like, okay. You know, Russ, Lair, Russ told me that might happen. And he's right. still coming in every morning. We're still focused on the same three things. Um, instead of the leader who tells people what they want to hear and tells Brian something slightly different than what he tells Kathy. And, you know, and, and oh, people are sad. Maybe I'll tell them I'll try to get them promoted next time. And, you know, and those are the people that, they leave that meeting happy, and two months later, they realize that their leader's just been creating misery for them, and they leave. So clarity of message, consistency of message, or just being truthful? It's not yeah, telling people what, what they need to hear, even if it's hard for them to hear it, and they don't agree with it, uh, that's the way you build trust with your team, you know? And they, they leave the room maybe unhappy in that moment, or sad in that moment, but later on, they realize, okay, well, you know, Russ told me that three months ago, and here we are, right. instead of wait, you told me, you know, that you'd talk to Dick about promoting me to senior director if I stayed here through this rough patch. Right. Ben, how how do you view that, building that trust or building that commitment? I think that's right. Look, uh, a lot of it, um, you know, when you're in a place like Silicon Valley where there's a lot of competition for talent and people do have a fiduciary responsibility to their families to take the best opportunity for them, um, it is a little more uh, nuanced um, than in most places, but I think Dick's getting at the thing, which is, you know, you got to remember when, when you go uh, to work somewhere, you start to kind of a little bit become your environment. And, you know, particularly the younger you are, the more you become your environment. And so if it's a place where you feel like you're either not learning or becoming a worse person, like not the person you want to be, then, you know, that's when you really, you know, even if you're a loyal person, you're going to want to leave, you know, and vice versa. If you feel like, okay, now, look, I, I'm actually really learning how to be the person I always wanted to become because, like, this is the kind of leadership I have and this is how it's going, then then that's going to make you stay. And a lot of that, you know, to Dick's point is, 
you know, like how loyal are you to your people? Are you committed to telling them the truth? Are you committed to their development? Are you going to really tell them when something's in their best interest or not in their best interest? Right. Uh, this is the horrible thing about being a leader. You kind of get the environment that you create. You get the people who will behave the way you do. And so, like, your flaws get magnified in a really horrifying way if, if, uh, if you don't work on them. So, like, I, I think one of the most important things to get loyalty is, like, you got to really work on yourself and make sure you're the type of person that somebody's going to want to work with. Right. Uh, and if you do that, then, you know, that's the, that usually is the, the biggest thing you can do. If a military, ex-military, active military comes in and says, like, look, I want to go work for your new startup or I want to go work for one of our portfolio companies, what are the positive and negative biases that sort of pop into your head or are you past that? I can tell you immediately what mine were. The positives were this person will be, uh, you know, I know they're going to come in, they're going to be mentally tough, they're going to work their ass off, and they'll be, like, not distracted by, like, nonsense like oh there's a bad mean blog post about us in business insider <laughs> you know i mean you would be you laugh but you'd be you right. know surprised they um, don't fall into a puddle they're not either. they're not gonna they're not gonna you know, <laughs> run out of the room Media. screaming <laughs> um so that's and that's great and that's worth its weight in gold the only negative that can that i can think of is the um in in a couple specific cases for me there was a lack of just um, domain expertise in the thing that I, where I really wanted them to work, and they had to come up to speed on that. So I would look for areas where I thought, well, this person's going to be able to come up to speed on it, um, right. and they'll be able to do it very quickly. And in fact, in both cases, they were incredibly successful. Yeah, I'd say so. T- to me, um, and I think those are really right. T- to me, the biggest thing about uh, having somebody who opted to go into the military and then has spent time there is when you look at a company, people are in your company for a variety of reasons. Like they're, they're doing it to get rich or they're doing it to like you yeah. know, for their image of changing in the world or they're doing it to advance their career. And for the best company, like the, the very best work experience, the very best companies when they're doing it for each other. Um, yeah. you know, That's and, a great point. And a lot of people come out of Stanford or you know, uh, Berkeley Computer Center don't understand what that means. Yeah. Um, and don't understand what it means to do something bigger than yourself. That's but if somebody's point. been in the Marines um, or, you know, and decided to do that, like you really know what that means and you know the power of it and, uh, you know, what it means not just in the job but in life. And so having people in the company who can lead the company to that kind of thing, you know, to me, is is the number one reason why... <laughs> You know, I would just rate that very highly. Yeah, I think that a from a point. cultural standpoint, that's the number one thing that I look for in a in any kind of organization that I'm involved in. Because at the end of the day, that is what's going to matter. Ben, you you addressed the uh, graduating class from Columbia last year, and <laughs> your basic message was: don't follow your passion. Why yeah. crush everyone's dreams? Like, what, what was that all about? I think I'd listen to the whole speech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when you're in college, people that give you this advice, follow your passion. And, and it's actually difficult advice because, like, one, um, you know, my passion when I was 20 years old was to, to be a rapper. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that's great. Um, but, like, I, I didn't really have the talent. Uh, and so, you know, is that really the thing that I should be doing? And then, you know, the other thing is, like, what you love at 20 isn't necessarily what you love at 25 or 30 and so forth. And so the point I wanted to make to them was, you know, follow your contribution. Like, what do you feel like where you can really make a difference and do that? And you'll end up really liking it. And, I, and it's a little bit of a false thing because people who are super successful go, yeah, I'm totally passionate about my work. But it didn't start that way, right? Like, they're passionate because they're successful. Like, they're, they're great at it. They love doing it. You know, like, if they sucked at it, they wouldn't be passionate about it. And so, like, my passion wasn't to be a venture capitalist, but I love doing it because I'm good at it. And then I always thought follow your passion was the most self-centered, like, advice, like, ever. It's like, oh, it's all about me. What do I love to do, you know? Right. Like, well, like, how about, you know, what you can contribute to, to others and what you can do for the world? And the, the biggest thing that I've learned as I've gotten older is that the biggest secret to life is... Um, what you contribute means a lot more than what you get. 
I mean, you went from, you followed your passion, but it seems like you found your passion too, building companies and, and, and running them. Well, look, if I had auditioned for Saturday Night Live and gotten in, I would have done that, you know, but I didn't get in. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, it's a hard audition. You know, like, it's a hard audition. And, um, they rejected But a Jim bunch Carey. of people didn't get in at the time. I just happened to have, you know, Tina auditioned and didn't get in around the same time. But, you know, she was like, I'm, I don't have anything else I'm going to do. I'm doing this. So I got to figure it out. Uh, and I had my computer science degree to fall back on and loved doing it, loved doing that too. So I went back to technology. Do, does everyone in, in, in technology have to be an entrepreneur at some sort of core or are there roles where it's not necessarily entrepreneur um, at the heart of things? It's better if most people aren't entrepreneurs than too many generals, not enough soldiers. I mean, like, I don't know. No, I totally think, yeah, agree. I mean, I'd I rather have somebody who's not an entrepreneur yeah. a lot of times. Yeah, it's good to have people who are entrepreneurial in your company but if mm-hmm. but you you know entrepreneur really entrepreneurs people who are great entrepreneurs have like and and um have amazing short-term memory loss like they're just <laughs> like even going back and starting this company now that i'm starting i'm like oh god i forgot what I'm like and even though I've, I've done it four times i was out in the in the lobby of our office the other day and I said god i forgot what a pain in the ass like setting up xyz is and you know, my assistant's like, you've done this like five times. How can you not remember what it's like, you know? I was like, I just keep, I forget, you know? And then you start over and you're like, well, this is going to be amazing. And you have to do all that stupid stuff again. Um, and so I think there, there, there are a few of those people and probably more doing it than should. And there's plenty of room for great leaders um, in, in Silicon Valley who aren't entrepreneurs. As leaders, I want to ask you this first, Ben, and you too, Dick, but when, when people start calling for your head, media, investors employees. It's happened to you, I know. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's happened to both of us. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> what, what, like, how do you process that, and then how do you get through it? You just got to focus on the mission. I mean, like, it is what it is. You know, like, people aren't... If, as a leader, uh, everybody likes what you do, you're not a, you're, you're a politician. Right? Yeah. Like, you're running for president yeah. at that point. You get paid to make the decision that's unpopular, right? Like, like, like if everybody knows the direction the organization should go in, then they don't need you, right? It, it's when you do something that people think, oh, that's the wrong direction, and they don't like, uh, that's going to be the actual important work that you do. And so there are going to be times when the people who don't like that are investors or people in the press. And if you look at any of the really outstanding CEOs, they've all gone through that. That's just how it is. And, uh, You can't worry about it. And then the other thing for me, and I was lucky uh, in that I had a board that I really trusted. And I said to the board um, on probably too many occasions, but I I, I would say to them, I'd say to Mark was on my board. I'd say, Mark, look, if you need to fire me, you don't even have to sit me down and tell me I'm fired. You just like tap me on the shoulder and like, we're going to have the conversation. Like I'm, I'm, I'm done. If you think I'm not the best person to run this company, it's not a problem for me. Because I'm not, a, it's, this isn't about me. This right. is about the company. And I'm a big shareholder. I want it to succeed. Don't even worry about it. Just just give me a nod and I'm gone. And but, so, and, yeah. and I think that's how you have to feel as a leader, right? You're trying to. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, I had the exact same conversation with my board many times, it, you know, long before the IPO. Like, hey, listen, when it comes time for, don't ever have any conversation behind my back about it. Right. Just come tell me you're not the guy anymore and I'll. Like, listen, I'll be cooperative and, and you're not going to get any grief from me about severance. I'll just go, great, thanks. It's been an amazing experience and I'll be super supportive of whatever you want to do next. And you, if you don't have that attitude about it, you're just going to be, you know, then, then you're just going to be miserable and you're not going to be able to lead because you're going to be constantly thinking, well, what would the board be happy if I do, right? right? And you can't, there's no way to just going to create right. misery for everybody, and most it's, of all yourself. And, and what you're describing, both of you, it's not like you have to be thick-skinned. You just need to be, one, truthful and um, engaged in the right way, it sounds like to me. Well, it hurts your feelings. Look, like when somebody says you're like the worst CEO ever, <laughs> no. if you're an egomaniac out of control or you have no strategy, yeah, it hurts your feelings. <laughs> I, have like, great, oh, I have a great hey. story about and then, that. And like, you, totally your friends right. send you the, the article. They're like, yeah. hey, Ben, I know. Like, what do you think of that? I was like, what the fuck do you think <laughs> you about that? It's true. I, would, I got to the point where I was ignoring that stuff. And then a friend of mine would say, wow, did you see this? And I'd look at him and I'd like, Jesus, why'd you send that to me? It's horrible. But, you know, uh. My daughter texted me one day. At the end of um, 2014, she's like, hey, Dad, bad news, good news. What's the bad news? She's like, the bad news is Yahoo said, my daughter's 17 now, she's 16 at the time. 
at 15 at the time, she sends me this text and says, the bad news is Yahoo Finance says you're one of the five worst CEOs of 2014. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, what's the good news? She goes, you're number five. <laughs> I want to shift a little bit to the U.S. military and kind of what happens coming out of it from a company creation standpoint. And Israel has this incredible company formation machine that starts with the military. You work on teams together and... It seems like, you know, every other team starts their own company. Is there... Well, every, everybody in the country of Israel is in the military. So, yeah, like, yeah. You, like uh, I wouldn't take the military process to be the company building. It's just like if you're an entrepreneur and you're from Israel, you were in the military. That's so, okay. <laughs> kind so, of a tautology there. But they do go out and they, like, start companies Well, together. so there... So it is... I'm just so, wondering what's missing here or no, is there an opportunity? Look, look I, I think there's definitely a lot of uh, relevant things that come across. But the other thing that that is kind of more important is systems thinking, well, like how mm -hmm. do systems work? Mm -hmm. You know, be it yeah. a technical system, an organizational system, a company. And that's what you need, you know, as CEO from a leadership perspective, you, know, you need people who think about it in a systems context. One of the things about being in the military is it's a system that's evolved over centuries and the knowledge that's gone into, how it's organized, how instructions come down, how they're kind of validated and followed and so forth. It, you can't be part of that and not think, okay, if we take this action, then there's these consequences we know about. There's these unintended consequences. You know, like how does that move through and like how are people affected? So that is all, I would say, just very, very valuable. I think there are things that go uh, kind of across anyone with a military background. Like there, there is no leadership real leadership training for sure in college here and typically uh, not even in business school. There's no leadership mm -hmm. training or no meaningful leadership training. And in the military, that, that is kind of a, a real fundamental part of the experience. And so that tends to be very useful because as Dick will tell you, one of the reasons Dick and I started spending a lot of time together was just how necessary management training is here because yeah. nobody has it nobody. and nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> and so if you don't teach it in your company, uh, you're going to have a really poorly run company. And so to have people who come in with an orientation around that is super powerful. And then there's all, you know, there are, you know, to the extent that you have technical training, that's also incredibly valuable in, right. uh, in Silicon Valley for sure. You know, one of the things you, I remember you telling me, which most people in management roles in Silicon Valley don't implement is make sure everybody understands what you understand. If I had <laughs> to summarize simple. Ben's management course, it's make sure everybody understands what you understand. And people coming in from uh, the military have that perspective m much more deeply um, ingrained in them than 95% of people who are in management roles in Silicon Valley. I would even do things like ask a director of engineering, hey, does, are you sure everyone on the iOS team knows what the top three priorities? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. We're all, we're all on the same page. Uh-huh, go down there at, you know, 9 p.m. at night or 10 p.m. at night, go up to a couple of the iOS engineers. What are the top three priorities of, like, what you guys are working on? You know, this guy's got, you know, X, Y, and Z prime, and this guy says, no, 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 it's A, B, and, you know, four. And so that's how most people manage yep. in Silicon Valley. Let's open it up to questions from you guys. So... We're coming from a military institution where there are good leaders and bad leaders, and we all have anecdotal experiences with that. But the very nature of what we did required mission accomplishment. So if there was a bad leader, we rallied, you kind of worked around it. And the bad leader wasn't always aware that they were a bad leader. But here, there's this <laughs> environment, right? If you're a bad leader, I mean, there's not that same level of commitment to your company, right? I'm going to go somewhere else where I'm recognized as this is meritocracy, mm -hmm. right? So then they leave and then the bad leader is like, well, everyone left. Was it the market or was it that I was a bad leader? And then, you know, their career can decide. What I was hoping that you could provide insight on for us was highlighting when that objective lesson is really required because we all know that like there have been times that we've needed to pull that out. But in our institution, that's also like a sign of marketing. That's like a bravado brand that you kind of bring to the table. Um, like the first day of prison, like I'm going to talk the deepest and talk the loudest. And that means mm -hmm. I'm a good leader. <laughs> Could you provide some insight on maybe the strategies you've seen where that's necessary to break people in public? But then kind of when it's where we lack is trying to read 
people as people who come from completely different backgrounds and different experiences and how to really motivate them to do what they need to do and stay loyal to you. You know, generally like these tools, you, you, you always want to do anything as a leader because it's effective, not because, you know, it's your personality or it makes you feel good about yourself or whatever to like yell at somebody or so forth. So I think that if you go into a meeting and you go, look, it's really critical in this company that for just a simple example, meetings start on time, like we're going to be precise we're going to work hard. We're not, we're going to be respectful of each other and not waste each other's time by coming into a meeting 30 minutes late or something. Then, you know, one, one of my favorite st- stories is Andy Grove at Intel, who is like, and he's running Intel. Intel's a gigantic company and he's in the meeting um, and somebody walks in five minutes late and he looks at them and he says, all I have in this world is time and you're wasting it. That is like, how could you make anybody feel smaller? <laughs> His purpose there was to, one, to let everybody in that room know how important it was to be on time, but then also say it in a way that was so colorful. Even I heard it, and I didn't even work at Intel, right? <laughs> and so that kind of spread. So that's like a, an instance of doing something that was very effective and got people highly disciplined. And there was a ton of kind of Intel stories like that. He would get to work early in the morning, and if your desk was messy, he'd write you up. <laughs> like Andy Grove would write you up and tell you clean up your desk. But it was just all around, you know, we are making, we're in a precision business. We've got to be on time. We've got to be organized and that kind of thing. And so if that's what you want, um, you've got to teach them those kinds of object lessons. That's different than being having a bad day and losing it on somebody where, like, you're just, they had a different opinion than you or they challenged you or your, your decision and said, well, why are we doing it this way? And you just explode at them. That's terrible because now people aren't going to tell you the truth, right? So you, you get a different outcome. So you have to think about like what your behavior, you know, like what's the, what, what is the re- end result of your behavior uh, when you do something like that in public? And that's the kind of, that's the leadership. Uh, that's the discipline of the leader to, to make sure that you're being effective and getting what you want and teaching the lessons you want known and not getting unintended consequences because you can't control yourself. You're acting like an idiot. Um, And it's a fine line, right? It it actually looks the same to everybody, but it's not the same. I would always tell my managers and leaders, you have to help people understand why we must achieve what we must achieve. You can't just tell them what they have to do. Well, Leanne says that we're out of time. I'm, uh, uh, all right, all right, so all right. I want to thank Dick and Ben. Thank you guys so much. Uh, and you guys have been great. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.